So Heidi, when you post a recording to the cloud, can anybody access it from there? No, I download it then, and then I post it on my website, the Wisdom Factory, but also on the Damiano platform. Hey, Jerry. Oh, I see. Nice to see you. Hi, Heidi. Nice to see you too. <laughs> All right. So, up to you. Okay, so I think we can um, get started here. So great to see everyone today. And Karen, I like your uh, new nature background. <laughs> it's nice to see the uh, outdoors right there. So um, today I thought we could discuss something that's been on my mind a lot uh, recently, which is um, what, or I should say, who are some of the people that we think are um, demonstrating or coming from second tier consciousness or teal or whatever in society that are not explicitly integralists. So people that we think are manifesting second tier consciousness, but they're not Wilbur readers, at least as far as we know. And I've heard a lot of different names thrown out there. <clears throat> um, and I kind of wanted to explore why we think these people are second tier integral. And to me, this, is, this has an importance that goes beyond simply labeling people and seeing if they're, you know, in our tribe or whatever. To me, it's kind of an important exercise to, so that we can understand um, what integral looks like outside of this explicitly Wilburian aqual framework. And this is where I've seen a lot of disagreement. Some people think that Trump is integral. Some people think that Barack Obama is integral. Some people think that uh, Jordan Peterson is integral. Some people think Sam Harris is integral. And so it's like, there seems to be a lot of contradiction and, and, and it seems like people's biases kind of come to the forefront too. So I wanted to explore this and have people mention, you know, just mention some names. And my hope is by the end of the conversation, we can have two things. We can one, have a better understanding of what it means to be second tier in general and how that manifests without knowing about Ken Wilber. And the second one is to compile a list of people who we think are, who are there so that we can all go and read them and discuss it later or just have a resources. And, and, and you know, as I was uh, saying in Charles' group on Monday, there are supposedly 1% of the world's population is at a second tier stage. That's 76 million people. You know, where, where the heck are these people? You know, and I Im imagine most of them would probably be in developed countries. So yeah, where, this is the uh, Zizek, you know, where are the postmodern neo-Marxists, right? Where are the integralists? Where the heck are these guys? Um, so I thought it would just be fun to throw this around. Uh, and one more thing is, I think I'm going to, for this, I want the time to be two minutes and 30 seconds again, because I think it may be helpful to, if people are giving explanations for why you think a certain person is second tier, a little bit more time would be helpful. And the introduction will do one minute and 30 seconds so that people have some time to share. Um, so for the intros, I thought everyone could share um, maybe just a few names on on some uh, maybe major public intellectuals or just people that we probably all know of who you think are manifesting second tier consciousness who, are, who do not know of Ken Wilber and give a little explanation of why, what are some of the characteristics or traits or qualities or you know, what parts of their philosophy or thought do you think are, are second tier. And also we'll throw again, we'll throw in that little fun fact about ourselves and so last time was our favorite snack. And this time, the fun fact will be, what's your dream vacation? So we can kind of all get to know each other a little better. So I'll just start really briefly. Um, so in terms of people that I thought might be second tier, I've, I've recently discovered a guy named Jeremy Rifkin, who I really appreciate his work on kind of decentralized uh, networks in society where people can exchange things freely in the, he calls it the collaborative commons. Um, and he, he mentioned some thinkers, he mentioned a thinker named Owen Barfield, who uh, I, I was researching and he seems to be, he's, uh, he died a while ago, but he seems to be someone who definitely demonstrates integral consciousness and has writ written books on evolution of human consciousness and has different stages that he calls by different names than spiral dynamics, which I found very interesting. And my dream vacation would be to, to go hiking in New Zealand. So uh, anyone feel free to jump in. Okay, I think I can go next. Um, yeah, so just some some people just uh, off the cuff uh, that I think demonstrate this type of thinking. 
is um, uh, Joe Rogan is one of them. Uh, Elon Musk. Uh, uh, I would say um, there's a, a guy named Eric Weinstein. He's sort of part of the IDW, the Intellectual Dark Web. Uh, people that I don't think necessarily demonstrate that type of uh, thinking are, are, are Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. I think they're they're almost there, but um, but I think that the 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 way that they talk with each other, the the collective part, the collective um, unit that they are, like the IDW, I think that is uh, integral type thinking. Also, Andrew Yang, I think he's an integral type thinker. Um, so yeah, and then one of my, uh, favorite, uh, or some, some place that I dream, vaca dream vacation, uh, I don't know, the moon, want to go to the moon. Thanks, Max. Maybe Elon Musk can help get you there one day. Yeah. Yeah, I think Elon Musk wants to go straight to Mars. Um, I'm not so much um, extended into the social, the, the lower right, as you folks seem to be. Um, I'm more in the upper left. And the one person I came up with was a writer, a poet and translator, Stephen Mitchell. Um, Meetings with the Archangel, That's but I realized that's actually third tier. And I would also say my current guru, Ishwar Puri, third tier. But communicating through the second tier with first tier. There are a lot of people out there who don't necessarily, who aren't necessarily aware of Ken Wilber, but are working at those levels. So I'll be interested to hear what other names you folks come up with. My dream vacation would not be in the physical body. It would be in at least seven dimensions. I think I was there once. I'm possibly deluding myself, but I want to go back. That's it. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm going to say a bunch of names. I'm not even sh I sort of feel like they're maybe late green and maybe sort of on the way to integral there's quite a lot of people that are like that i think a lot of people on the on the alt right um or the the idw some of which were mentioned so i'd say uh jordan pearson um uh, there's a guy called gad sad um i kind of dread saying this but sometimes milo yiannopoulos who's a bit of a sort of provocateur sometimes i find I wouldn't say he's integral, but there's, there are ways the way I sort of seems like kind of on the way. Um, and even like, I get a little bit confused sometimes with um, sometimes people dealing with politics uh, in our current time, like even Trump, like I wouldn't for the, for the, uh, for a minute say that Trump seems to be integral, but there's some way my mind get confused around like dealing with political correctness or, um, uh, dealing with the pathologies of green, like for example, advocating for nationalism without um, uh, just being about nation, just just being about nationalistic sort of impulses, like seemingly not full of like racism and yet being against political correctness and uh, some stuff like this. Um, and then there are ones that I think probably more bona fide, but I think a lot of these people actually already know can. So Howard Bloom, um, he's written some great stuff about capitalism. Um, Warren Farrell, he talks about men's rights. I, I know he knows Ken, actually. Um, and possibly on the sort of guru side of it, possibly like Ajay Shanti. Um, I don't think he gets, enough, he gets enough credit. I'm not actually sure if he's integral or not. He seems kind of a bit middle greenish kind of integral. And um, I think that's my my general stance and a lot of these people I'm sort of slightly, slightly confused. And, um, yeah, I'm going to be a little bit with, uh, with Karen, like I've been kind of all over the subtle body. So when I was thinking of like, uh, where I'd like to vacate to, I kind of was thinking about like, um, uh, astral travel. I'm kind of, my jury's out on whether that's kind of possible, but I'm sort of, uh, 
really wanting to get some answers so that's kind of where my my mind my mind went so uh, yeah that's thank me. you thanks paul okay um i guess i'll pop in here uh there's just so many there's so many people uh let me just throw out a few i think uh, Timothy Morton, his writing on hyperobjects and dark ecology is a very integral, a perspectival expression. Um, I love William Gibson and his writing, especially um, post Neuromancer, late 90s, early 2000s. He's very interested in, in the question of temporics and time, and he always talks about uh, science fiction examining an incomprehensible present. And uh, I really love that. And I think he, he is, he's got a lot of interesting concepts about uh, temporics, the past, the present, and the future, and kind of unpacking the present. Um, Edgar Morin is great with complexity sciences, complexity. Uh, he has that, uh, what's it called again? Um, uh, Homeward Earth or something like that. Uh, he's got a great book. He's a French thinker. Uh, Rick Tarnas, of course. Um, Donna Haraway, I love her book, Staying with the Trouble. Uh, exploring a lot of these kind of ecological concepts, jumping around. Uh, Jeff Vandermeer on the on the subject of ecology and hyperobjects. Um, his book Annihilation and the Southern Reach trilogy is amazing. It's it's beautifully written. It's aesthetic a perspectivity. Um, I want to also throw some uh, some uh, light on William Irwin Thompson, who actually is an integral thinker. He he's written many many books about the evolution of consciousness and um, uh, he's done a lot of work with a lot of other peers, actually, with the Lindis Farn Association. If you just Google that, it's a pretty awesome think tank collaborative group of thinkers with like Carl Sagan and Lynn Margulis and Ralph Abraham and a lot of other guys you'll probably be familiar with. Lynn Margulis, too. Uh, symbiosis or theory of uh, symbiotic evolution. James Lovelock, his theory of, you know, planetary ecology and the kind of the, the uh, Gaia hypothesis. Um, other pop culture folks, Ursula K. Le Guin, for obvious reasons, in The Dispossessed, and uh, Always Coming Home. Maria Popova, actually, as a pop culture icon. Um, I love what she's doing with time and temporics and combinatorial creativity as kind of a response to post-modernity, I think, and deconstruction. Um, maybe, maybe you can stop there, Jeremy, and um, we'll, we'll explore. Vacation? Some, there's a great list to start. Maybe, yeah, just go to the vacation. <laughs> A mountain. I just want to somewhere in the uh, Pacific Northwest mountains. I would love to just go over there into the rainforest and enjoy that. So yeah. Great. Come visit me and we'll go to the Olympics. Hell yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I just want to welcome um, Greg. Welcome. Thanks. I just unmuted my mic. Um, yeah, I used to live in Portland, Oregon and was up in the Pacific Northwest, went to the rainforest a number of times. I'm in um, northern Italy right now. Great. Well, just to catch up on the conversation, Greg, we're, we're just finishing our intros here. And the subject for today is uh, where we see integral consciousness manifesting in the general public, especially with people who are not explicitly Wilburians. And um, we're just giving a one minute, 30 second intros on uh, like some of the people we think are integral and also just for fun where your dream vacation is. And it's cool to hear that you're looking for. I'm, I'm in Portland right now, too. So, um, yeah, whoever... Cool. Whoever wants to go next for their intro, uh, Charles Steele or Greg or Heidi. Go ahead, Heidi. I can go. I'm in Italy too, but in the middle. And um, I many of the names you, which were named so far, I don't know. I'm in, not in that culture, so I, I really cannot know that. For me, I don't think it's it's very useful to give a label to somebody. He is integral. I do think that people can be in their heart integral and they can still act in a different way, especially politicians. And so I would make a, a, a differentiation between uh, <laughs> the personal development, which you maybe not even see, maybe you do, but maybe you don't, and uh, the actions which people need to do for some reason, you know, so I don't know. I, I cannot uh, say that some names which I know from Germany, for instance, from Europe, you might not know them. So, And then there are most Wilburians. And uh, thanks to Jeremy, I'm discovering a little bit. Uh, um, 
And I talked with Thomas Mark, with whom you have talked to, Jeremy. And I, for instance, would say he, he but he's a barbarian, so maybe dream vacation everywhere where we can be together with people and have interesting conversations. <laughs> I could jump in real quick. Um, I'm Greg. I'm, um, let's see, people who I think are voices that are integral. I'm paying attention more or less to the healing and integration of the red and blue memes. I really like uh, what Aubrey Marcus is doing, Joe Rogan is doing, Jordan Peterson is doing. Uh, there's a lot of voices that have strong traditional values, strong red differentiation of self, those values, but they're healthy. Uh, we need those, that magical, mystical level. We need the um, ability to say, this is me, and to, to differentiate and to have good, strong values and ethics and those lines developed. And I think they're doing a a wonderful job and they have a huge audience. So uh, that's who I'm paying attention to or listening to actually, tuning into the most. And I love how they've, um, like with all due respect to Ken, I've rarely heard him except in his writings use I language, such as yesterday I did this and what I noticed was and that lends a kind of ethereal, abstract focus on ideas, uh, lens on a lot of uh, integral talk. And I really like the down to earth, kind of in the mud kind of conversations of, of people that are really wrestling with real issues and saying, this is what happened. This is how I resolved it. This is the process I used. Uh, this is where I landed, and this is how I kind of found my way back to unity. Because for me, um, integral in a personal level is about falling off, feeling lost, being in my pattern behavior, and then somehow groping my way back, usually through some kind of connection or relationship. Um, in terms of, uh, so anyway, that's my thing um, uh, on that. Uh, dream vacation, uh, again, what I'm with Heidi is that any place where there's shared relationship and communication is um, what I gravitate to. I've kind of, I've traveled quite a bit and right now I'm in, in Italy and in, in Northern Italy, I'm in the middle of where a lot of people would like to travel to. And um, so I kind of have that all around me by default. It's really beautiful up here. And so if there's a conversation going, I'm in. Great, thanks, <laughs> great. All, thanks. great. Great to have you join us today. All right, so uh, Theo and then Charles. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so for me, Integral Thinkers, one that I know, uh, that I read mostly, uh, Otto Scharmer, I think is one uh, in my field, management, uh, organizational change. Um, I think I agree with some, most of the names that were out there, uh, were, were, um, said, um, yeah, I think I'll just keep it at that for now. I don't, I don't have any specific, uh, memory. I think, you know, we, we enact integral values and in, integral worldviews in different ways. And it's, it's just, it depends, uh, also how the context in which you are is evolving. Uh, and are, are you participating at that level or are you participating more from what the context ask you to um, to act from? So it's it's not always, uh, I was thinking about it yesterday, I was reading uh, um, Cook Bruder's uh, thesis about it and I was like, oh, okay, it's, it's, an, an, it's a different, like, she, 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 she gives a description of all the different levels and she says that I think Paul, she would be one of, the, of the, the integral mind, I think, but she, she, she's quite close to Wilbur as well. Um, but we, we, most people are um, 
spanning from five, five to three uh, stages all at once. Uh, what else? Uh, where I would go vacationing. Um, I don't need to travel so much these days, so I don't know. But um, I'm in uh, Vancouver. I like it here. Uh, lots of nature. I think I visited uh, eight parks in the last uh, two days with a friend. So it's nice. It's nice around here. Thanks. I think that just leaves you, Charles. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. A vacation. Well, I've been retired for a number of years, so I'm kind of on a perpetual vacation. And I live in one of the loveliest parts of Canada. So, you know what, I'm on vacation now and I'm really quite happy where I am. Uh, if I could be transported to somewhere without, you know, with a, with a teletransporter and not have to take a plane or anything, I'd probably love to spend some time in Florence, Italy, visiting some art galleries and some of those gorgeous buildings I've only seen in documentaries. So getting back to our question, who among us, seven billion people are, are truly integral? You know, I've been thinking lately, uh, that's a really hard question to answer. Um, so let me contribute this. If we're reading somebody's books or we're thinking about somebody we've listened to on television or, or the internet, what are we looking for to decide whether somebody is second tier or not? Uh, I think it's very difficult. Um, the first thing I think you'd have to look for is whether the individual in a conversation with others or in a book is trying to look for what's right about any position that they're talking about. This seems to be the first commandment of integral. Look, look for uh, the rightness, uh, the truth in whomever you're thinking of because everybody's partially right. The second thing I think you'd have to think about is how many of the five elements, basic five elements of integral does this person embrace? And how would you know that without interviewing them? You know, stages, states, lines, uh, types, and uh, what's the other one? States. And uh, in, in how many lines, and. And how many lines of development would someone have to be at second tier to regard them as second tier? And, and which lines? Charles, maybe 15, be, 15 seconds. Which lines would be the crucial ones? So I've got uh, more questions and answers about this topic. Well, thanks, Charles. That was a great um, starting list of qualities, qualities to look for. And I hope to build on that throughout this conversation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another thing I think would be fun to throw into the mix would be what are some features of someone that would disqualify them? <laughs> you know, so if, if someone was a total Wilberian beautiful integralist, but said, but what's calling for, you know, some kind of ethnic genocide or something would that where, where one of their lines of development was so low or something, you know, that, that to me is interesting to think about in this way. What are some disqualifiers? Uh, but this was a great starting list. So thank you everyone for sharing. And I thought it could be fun since this is supposed to be a debate call, were there any names that were thrown out that people disagree with that they're, that they're integral? And if so, why? And this segment will be two minutes and 30 seconds. So anyone jump in. Yeah, go ahead, Charles. A few years ago, I listened to an episode of the um, Daily Evolver with uh, Jeff Saltzman. And uh, I forget what the topic was, but uh, President Obama had a lot to do with it. And uh, Saltzman is a great fan 
of Obama, was at the time, and described him as America's first integral president. And I, I sent him a rather spiky letter, taking issue with about everything he said. And I ran, ran down a list of what uh, Obama had done so far, and I think this was in his first term. And in his first term, uh, Obama had had bought into what he called the Washington Playbook. And the Washington Playbook has to do with the rules of politics in Washington, and especially the, uh, the love the Washington establishment has for warfare. So Obama learned very quickly, probably in his first cabinet meeting, that uh, he was going to be told what to say by the Pentagon, pretty much, with foreign policy. And one of the worst things I heard about him was that he uh, went along with the practice of being handed a briefing list every Tuesday, a list of uh, people that uh, the Pentagon and the CIA wanted to be killed. This is, this is called the famous kill list. Uh, it's in the public record, by the way, for any, any of you who are doubting this. Um, and, uh, and Obama started to act on it. And uh, when he was asked by some reporter uh, sometime later, uh, he said he was quite okay with it. It was American policy after all. So um, o Obama, uh, by, those, by those measures and uh, by just general failure of, of strong leadership, uh, struck me as not an ethical president at all besides. His stated center of gravity is at Amber. He professed himself to be a Christian, attends church, I understand. Um, so uh, I was, to say the least, uh, not persuaded that Obama was second tier. Um, I, I hope he's moved closer to that by now, but uh, I have no idea. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> I, it'll be interesting to see what uh, Salzman's response was. Go ahead, Heidi. Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying before, no? That's the difference of what you are in your heart and what you are doing. And if you listen to John Bunsell uh, and uh, his simple solution, he is stating very clearly that uh, politics has very, the politicians have very little power in, uh, in their decisions. And they come in and do uh, have big ideas and then they are immediately cut into, you know, into shape. So when you, by, by what a politician at the end does, when you take this to, to judge over the person, I don't think that's the right thing. You can say he didn't act as, uh, as if it was from an integral level, but as a person, he might be completely different. So just to make this distinction. Yeah, and I would add, it's, it's really context bound, like I was saying in the beginning. Um, in, a, in the context of American politics, uh, having a leader uh, is, I don't know, it's kind of a, I don't know how to say it, but it's, you don't have much power, obviously, but also you will have to act at a red level if you're working with red level sort of cultures, you know. Um, uh, I think that kind of could be perceived as an integral move, if you will. Um, your Pentagon might be more of a traditionalist structure, um, a more amber structure. Um, your, uh, you know, you have different department will will have different types of culture, um, and then you'll, you'll work with those. I think I think Obama was not too bad in that sense, but he also he missed out on a few uh, things. But he was probably didn't have much leverage. Uh, which is, which is to go back to basically the whole system is, is the whole political system is not integral at all um, in the US. Uh, you have two, um, you're bipartisan. Um, we see what's going on now. I think Ken did a really good description of what's going on in that sense. Uh, if, you if, you were if you were to have an integral politic, it would be a totally different approach to all of that. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's hard to say someone is acting 
integrally unless you've seen them and through a long period and obviously interviewing them to some extent and still they will hack a different actually one of the ways you see they will adapt to the situation in which they're involved and they're you'll see they're good um strategists good um how do i put it um yeah they they read the situation on many different levels and that's not easy especially if you have so much pressure as a president of the united states it's like what that's really like hard to do <laughs> So, yeah, that, that's my point. Well, if Karen, then Max, and then Charles. Yeah, interesting. Well, I, Charles, I am definitely with Heidi and Theo on the, the Obama question. Um, um, just to go to one point when there are five or six I could pick up, but um, maybe you, we on your Monday forum, we can chew into this further, but what I think I just heard you say was to define Obama as by definition Amber because he identifies as Christian and goes to church and I say hold on there <laughs> you can be Christian and be at any one of the structure stages all the way up into second and third tier um, and I would love to chew on that further but probably not in this venue uh, going totally sideways here Greg welcome and I just wanted to say that I agree with you about Ken Wilber except out of all of the 20 something 30 books he's written there are three that i know of where he did exactly what you said one of course was grace and grit or he talks about his, his five-year marriage and the death of his wife one was i think he calls it one taste he basically published his diary he kept a diary of his personal life and he goes into theory sometimes but it's uh, he, he does that stuff and there was one, oh yeah, boomeritis sort of. I mean, too much of yeah. it's like a college seminar, but he gets into gut feelings there too. So I just yeah, I, wanted to- I read that. all those and they were very good and I agree and, and remarkably different than how he often sounds speaking. Yeah. So that's enough for me for now. Okay, um, so I, I could just uh, kind of change gears a little bit and uh, just kind of bring up Jordan Peterson and uh, Sam Harris. And uh, just because they've been some pretty prominent thinkers and voices in the mainstream uh, recently. And um, some of the shortcomings that I see with these two thinkers, I, the, just to go back to what I said earlier was that the, the thing that I love about them both is that they're having a conversation with each other and they're creating this sphere to be able to have conversation. And I think that type of activity is exactly what we need. Um, but if we're just talking about the individuals, um, they are like verging on se second tier, I think. Like, uh, but they have shortcomings where Jordan Peterson um, seems to be like a pure sub subjectivist. He thinks that if you empower yourself, if you better yourself, then that's a solution to all the world's problems, including climate change, including whatever. Sam Harris is the exact opposite. He's a pure objectivist, and he sort of denies um, like like spiritualism, uh, like spiritual experiences. Except he also has a meditation app. So it's like, um, and and where Jordan Peterson, he's also he's like a, he's an academic, he's a clinical psychologist, and um, so, but they they both kind of fall short at being able to bridge that gap and being able to understand that there are these two different domains of truth. One is objective, the other one is subjective, and like uh, Sam Harris uh, will conflate, you know, uh, maybe some somebody who had a, a spiritual experience as being like red where he he's it seems like he's not really because he hasn't had the spiritual experience himself he's not able to recognize them as real and really meaningful it's just to him it seems like it's almost like a drug induced you know uh that there's not real meaning there that meaning is objective it's not sub it's not experiential and and where Jordan Peterson, he's <clears throat> the exact opposite. Um, and there was a conversation. Finish that, finish that thought, Max. Okay. Um, well, he, Zizek um, brought up Heinrich Himmler, 
and uh, when he was critiquing Jordan Peterson, and he was saying um, that Himmler had the Bhagavad Gita in his pocket, and that he was into these higher states of consciousness. And he was saying even the most enlightened spiritual experiences can serve a terrible, terrible uh, cause. So like just being purely experiential about morality and not taking into account this collectivism is a, a flaw of Jordan Peterson, I think. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Um, Charles, and then Jeremy. <laughs> Go ahead, Charles. I was just reminded that in order to be an integral thinker, you also have to touch bases with the four quadrants. Uh, Jordan Peterson is a, is a traditionalist, um, even a conservative, if you will, because his, his ideas about what, how, what, how young people can turn their lives around is entirely based on the left-hand quadrants. You know, take responsibility for your life, clean your room, throw your shoulders back, figure out what you want in life. Uh, this is a typical conservative attitude towards the way human beings should live. Whereas uh, liberals, say liberal Democrats, tend to emphasize the external conditions that make life hard for people and tend to favor governmental intervention in all kinds of social welfare programs and support for public education and, and the like. So it's probably easier to rule people out as second tier if you realize that they're only coming from uh, one or two quadrants, uh, especially the, uh, the left and the right, the interior versus the exterior, uh, than it is to figure out whether they're actually uh, integral. So anyway, uh, to the, yeah, so, the uh, five quadrant, uh, the four quadrants would be uh, another measure by which you would judge uh, someone to be integral. Um, but one more point on President Obama. Would a person who is solidly integral want to be president of the United States? Would that thought even cross his or her mind? And I'll leave it at that. I will have Jeremy and then Karen. And then just to answer Charles. Yes, Charles, my goal is to become president of the United States. I'll leave it at that. Oh, all right. <laughs> so I know one guy. <laughs> Maybe that disqualifies me from being teal. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeremy. All right, Ryan, you have my vote. Um, so yeah, let me tackle Obama first very quickly. Um, and I agree with what most of us are saying here that uh, in the political environment, especially in the United States, but in, in most of the Western world, um, this entrenchment between the left and the right, the traditional and the progressive, is so oppositional that I think we, we're so starved for mediation that like anybody who can kind of sit in the middle between the two is seen as, wow, they're integral because they can actually hold the conversation between the two. So I don't know if that's really criteria for integrality. And as, as Charles was saying before, you know, um, Obama's willingness to go along with US imperialism and militarism um, and be fairly compromised with, you know, big banks and big business for the past, you know, his, his entire presidency, um, you know, it really raises the question, is being integral just being able to speak to voting value systems? Or is it something more, more, more over, overreaching and systemic and a kind of a new way of thinking a, a, about society that's needed right now? So I don't know, I, I never really considered Obama integral. I thought he was a very eloquent speaker and mediator. Um, now, being post-oppositional could be an integral quality. So maybe there is a quality about him that was possibly like that. But I'm not, I don't know about like kind of stamping somebody with the marker, okay, this guy's integral, this is the integral president. I think all of us have these capacities to, to express integrality at certain moments. Um, now, Jordan Peterson, this is a longer 
I don't want to get into too many details here, but I, I generally do not see Peterson as, as an integral oriented thinker. Um, if anything, he's trying to express something that's been, that he feels has been left behind. And he calls himself like what classic, classic liberal. Um, and his emphasis is always on myth and meaning and dignity of the individual. And he doesn't really seem to understand or, uh, or, or really grok the postmodern turn. So again, you know, he's integral in the sense that he's showing, you know, uh, 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 an aspect of our world that needs to be integrated. But I don't think his framework is an integral one, um, even with the, the evolutionary psychology and all that stuff. So I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Okay, we'll have, we'll have Karen had her hand up. And then after Karen, uh, Greg or Paul, I, I want to give you a chance to speak too, since you haven't gone yet. So go ahead, Karen. Yeah, so I've, I was coming into this meeting thinking, okay, what what's the dividing point between integral, i.e. second tier and non-integral? And I was going toward the structure stages because they do develop in a certain order. And, um, and that's, that's a, a, a conversation Jeremy and I are probably going to have later on uh, um, as very much distinct from the state stage, the states of consciousness, and I totally buy that. You can be at a very, very high, even high third tier state of experienced consciousness and use it for terrible ends. As Ken Wilber punchily said, the Darth Vader move is possible at every level, which is why we need to um, clean up along with wake up, grow up, and show up. Um, so I've been focusing for what divides um, integral, i.e. second or third tier from first tier kind of totally on that axis. And my dividing line was, can you see depth? I.e., are you aware that all the stages are, that there are stages and they structure stages specifically and that they're all valid? That's the color spectrum, you know, starting with beige, magenta, all the way up, that they are all valid. We need them all. We need them all in ourselves and in our society and we want them to be healthy. Can you see that depth? To me, that was the, I was, that I po was positing that to myself as the definition, integral versus not integral. But since listening to Charles, I'm going to add um, quadrants, at least the awareness that there are four quadrants and, and make, at least making a conscious effort not to just dismiss any one of them. Oh, oh that's just not, that, that, I'm just not going to deal with that. Or that doesn't exist. So I now have a, a, a multi-dimensional um, working definition of what's integral and not integral. That's it for now. Greg or Paul, did you want to jump in here? I, I, what I picked up is um, how difficult it is to define second tier, and my bias that is um, that's kind of unconscious. But I, now that I'm speaking of it, it's not. I want a second tier person to be. Um, a bit like what Ken Folk describes as a cartoon saint. I want a Jesus-like figure at second tier who has love in their heart, who wants to do good things, and through their skill at seeing different perspectives and their awareness of the quadrants, I want them to be moving us forward or moving the people in their spheres forward. And so I have that bias lens and as I'm listening, um, I have no idea. You s I, I'm seeing the complexity of lines, the moral line of development, the ethical line of development. Um, there can be somebody once was writing about Henry Kissinger at the choral level and describing very eloquently, well, you could be wrecking the world and part of the Illuminati and amassing great wealth to your own pockets and those of your colleagues, I suppose. So I, I, I'm just kind of seeing the complexity of trying to parse this out and also my own bias. I, I'm, I'm done, thanks. Um, I guess I feel a little bit like, like Charles was saying, like probably having more questions than answers. I'm definitely on with the consensus of what seems like talking about integral behavior or integral thinking and speech rather than like, it, it does seem very difficult to pigeon somebody as integral, like carte blanche. And, um, 
I definitely think to me the the stages of development or seeing society as um, as developing and as kind of um, progressing to me to me is a big sign. Like if, for example, and I think Jordan Peterson is probably one of the uh, most interesting to me, maybe because I know a little bit more about it. Like he often seems confused about green or talks about it in terms of like a wrong turn. Um, like having heard very little about um, but basically the positives of green and to add like, I guess on a, on the like line development, like I've, I've always been a little bit confused um, in, in his knowledge of psychology, like knowing lots about young, knowing he's, he's a psychologist himself, which can kind of be green, but then I'm a little bit like, um, I often think of therapy as being divided a little bit between orange and green and orange tends to feel more uh, rational. Like sometimes I think of, I get confused about Freud, for example, like, is he orange or is he green? Um, and it feels like this kind of distance from the emotions that feels more orange, like that's more uh, rational. And this is like a very, a very green thing to say, but there's sometimes why I look at Peterson and I make a judgment about his, his uh, emotional sort of being the way he seems to come across. Um, I'd be a bit with Charles, but on a different angle, like the blue, like he, he comes across as very blue, like very out of touch with his emotions and quite repressed, which is maybe just a line of development. Like maybe he's uh, green psychologically, but, but uh, isn't necessarily embodying it. But I guess my, my general takeaway is it's quite interesting when you, um, when you discuss various people's lines and, and different levels, it really does get quite complex. And, um, I sort of feel more on the on the ambiguity line in this call this time than sort of um, having any certainty. It's probably why I'm a little bit more more quiet than normal. So I think Heidi wants to say something, and then I'll jump in after that and propose something. Okay. So go ahead, Heidi. Yeah, I I was following Erden Peterson for three years almost now, and I was asking the question: Is he where is he? And I discovered that he is neither blue, neither orange, neither green, and red neither. So for me, the only way is that he must be integral. And what I see is a big misunderstanding. What you say, Paul Freya, that he is not in touch with his emotions. I see he is explicitly in touch with his em emotions, and he's even daring to show them in, in public. So uh, that's, for me, it's really green. <laughs> when you say that he's not green, then in, in his way of being able to care for others, that's green. But he doesn't know that's green because he doesn't recognize as a, a level of development. And by the way, Ken Wilber didn't either for a long time until he discovered and thought that might be a level of development. And that he is working f uh, to reintegrate blue People think then that he is in the blue level, but he's not. He's just working for that because it's, uh, it's an important task he has discovered to, to do. So when that's the same thing what I said uh, at the beginning. When I work for something, if, if Kate works with uh, people in the, in the prison and has to use red language to talk with them, that doesn't make her red. So, you know, we, I think we must be much more nuanced and maybe use the exclusion instead of attribution method. So I just want to say really quickly, um, I was going to propose, we have about 40 minutes, which is plenty of time. I was going to propose trying breakout groups since there seemed to be kind of two strands of dialogue. There was a Jordan Peterson track and the Barack Obama track. And, and um, it seems like now we're kind of on the Jordan Peterson track. Uh, I'm wondering if you guys want to stay on this and kind of go deeper and kind of use him as an example and kind of focus it around that so we can get a better understanding of second tier or if people wanted to try. Yeah, go ahead, Heidi. When you do the breakout groups in every breakout group must be somebody co-host for to be able to record. They must record it then on their uh, computer. Otherwise it is lost for the rest of us. So make everybody co-host who, uh, who is around and so we, in the breakout group, we have to decide who is recording. Oh, okay. <laughs> Another thing to think about. Um, but, but if this is interesting, I thought we could just continue on with the, with the Peterson track and kind of focus the discussion a little ah, bit. Okay. I see a lot of nods. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so uh, Theo. 
Yeah, I, I didn't study so much uh, Jordan Peterson or Sam Aris. I, I didn't feel attracted to what they were doing for some reason. Um, but I do agree with ID that, yeah, um, he's showing some integral move. And one, one uh, he's looking at it from a more integrated perspective for sure, um, from what I know. And one thing I notice is that um, sometimes also it's 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 all, it's the it's the information the data you came across that will will make it will you will come up differently about how you understand the world. So if you study many different fields in your integral, you have a, you'll have a tendency to really understand the quadrants, not even knowing about the quadrants. Um, you know what I mean? Like you don't know that they are like somebody actually framed it that way or, um, but then you start understanding the dynamic uh, just by observing all of this data you came across in your life. I think that is important to distinguish between, you know, when we say Wilburian, like it's people who know about this framing, we know about this structure that was actually observed and then theoreticized into a meta theory and so on. So it's, it's really different uh, they'll have a different language, they'll have a different uh, approach to it. For me, Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris, why I'm not interested in them, I think maybe it's just, I kind of had to do this reintegrating with my blue sphere at some point. I had to kind of make peace with religion to some, to some respect. Uh, and I did it differently, probably. And what they're talking about for me is not so uh, valuable right now. Um, but it might be for some others, and I see I see that it is. So it's it's great for that. And I just want to jump in. He is not doing only that. He is doing these uh, psychological lectures on YouTube, and this is the real uh, insight which you can get. And also the biblical uh, lectures. I got uh, re reconciled with my Christian uh, heritage as a culture by him and by nobody else. Uh, because I can now appreciate uh, our culture, you know, which before I thought, oh, religion. So I really uh, thank him as much as I thank to Ken Wilber for the insight of the major theory. Um, these are the two big influences in my life, which I'm really, really, really grateful for. And I don't uh, allow people put him in the conservative blue uh, something corner. Uh, and leave him there, you know? No, <laughs> it's not. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, gonna have to get going, guys. But um, yeah, I, I, I uh, would like to continue this conversation if anybody's interested. And, and uh, yeah, Jordan Peterson is uh, is an awesome guy. I'm, I'm, I'm totally with him. I guess uh, what I was trying to do was just sort of critique some of his blind spots, and. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what stage he's at or whatever, but um, he's definitely an important. Uh, I think he's kind of said what he's need to say, and kind of moving on, like uh, from him being so center stage. But, anyways, uh, just wanted to thank you guys for uh, holding the space here today. And uh, if anybody's interested, uh, I can contact you guys, and we could have a private conversation about any of these things. I always happy to talk about philosophical issues <laughs> thank you max um but, but yeah let's uh let's do it let's talk some more okay i think paul I was, wants to say something and then we'll have greg uh yeah go ahead yeah i was gonna say because i i think i have just a slightly different emphasis with you heidi but it's i i totally share the whole uh christianity thing like um watching a few of those lectures brought christianity you know, in just a massive way um like I, I pretty much spend my Sundays like a sort of traditional Christian, like that's my thing. Um, and I think there is a lot, I actually find it kind of confusing trying to navigate because I was watching all these these lectures and stuff, basically like kind of bringing young and some of this kind of uh, deep psychological analysis into the Bible, I, I thought was just just profound. Like, for example, one of the ones that I, I really took away was this really deep dive into Abel and Cain this kind of like primordial sense of like good and evil. And um, I didn't know the Bible that well. You know, I kind of grew up in Greenland where the traditional and stuff was really bemoaned. And then I'm reading it. It's like, you know, Abel and Cain is like a few sentences or a paragraph or something. So to draw 
this massive lecture out of it um, was kind of profound. And but then there's so I, I guess this is sort of devil's advocate question is I've definitely seen Jordan Peterson like really be like weasel weasel word like kind of wiggling around. For example, around like I've seen people ask him, "Do you believe that Jesus walked on water or something like this?" And he'll say why he needs hours and hours and hours in which to explain that. I think this also probably draws a little bit on the um, quadrant bias. There's almost like, well, I'm going to have to explain upper left and possibly like lower left as in why it's good or moral, or there's a moral truth to it or something like this. Um, but where he seems to really wiggle around just saying probably scientifically, no, he probably didn't. Um, and there's quite a few different arguments where I've seen him do that. For example, there, there's a part in his book, I think, where he's talking about almost like there was an example of dealing with the homeless or something as a way of like, if you pull yourself up as an example, then you help the homeless person. And there's a certain truth to that. But there was the same kind of like wiggling around where he wasn't, he couldn't really be direct with the, the question, which kind of, for me personally, is why I put him in this kind of like strange on the way to integral, but it's still quite, like undefined where he doesn't seem to just come out with a brazenly blue perspective or quadrant bias. It seems to be there unconsciously, but then there's a wiggling around it. So it's kind of, um, I'm not sure what to make of it, but I think it's a sort of a useful uh, content for debate. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Paul. So we'll have Greg and then Heidi and then Jeremy. <laughs> um. I think Jordan Peterson is blind to uh, the territory of green and he lumps, you know, like the extremes of green in with going towards Marxism and collectivism and the social disasters that happened in Russia during the Bolshevik revolution and stuff. He sees that, the dangers of that, but he doesn't ever zoom out and say, well, what we're looking at is a stage of development that has some very good aspects that have been tremendous, but there's some extreme edge like there is at all stages. And um, here's what they are, and here's what's extreme about them. He doesn't have that zoom out level of looking at, at, at the green stage. I think what's appealing to him or what I see as second tier is he's able, he doesn't start out with an answer and then beat you over the head with it. He's not defending the viewpoint of a particular lens. And he's also very self-reflective. Like somebody said, well, where do you think this is going? Talking about his career act. And he said something like, well, of course, um, I would guess nowhere good. These things have a very short shelf life. They, you, they tend to end up very badly. And he's very, he's not, a salesman marketing a viewpoint so that he can get more views. He's, I mean, he does that perhaps, but he's also very self-aware. And he can say, I'm worried, I'm afraid, I'm stretched, I'm beyond max, I don't know where this is going. And that's so refreshing to hear. So I don't know where that is, but um, yeah, and he's pretty blind to what green is and he can't reflect on it so I'm yeah and um, for me it's just because he doesn't know integral map and and I actually right in the beginning maybe after half a year I was following him I wrote him a letter that it would be good to, to talk with Ken Wilber and to get into contact with this map because his his message would be clearer if he had the map and what you call, Paul, wiggling around, for me, that is exactly an integral quality that you don't say it is like that, but that you leave the perspectives open and that you don't say something which other people afterwards can nail you into it. But he tries to bring it from another point and from another perspective, from another perspective. And that's what I thought that it's an integral way of communicating, <laughs> not to take one position and that's it but trying to integrate uh, many other um, perspectives. And what else is integral than having 
a possibility to see things from several and as many pers perspectives as possible. Uh, Jeremy, I think, and then Charles. Yeah, this is a complex question. Um, you know, I, I've been uh, involved in some of these debates and questions on the integral forums um, and, and, and listened to some very interesting conversations. Uh, the Zizek Peterson debate comes to mind, but uh, I think we can, we can at least say that Peterson is expressing in a very articulate and compelling way the significance not only of the dignity of the individual and the meaning of the individual, but meaning itself and the archetypes and the maps of meaning that, you know, people say that they came, they came for the politics and they stayed for the biblical talks and the kind of the depth psychology talks. So I think there's a lot of hunger and thirst in, in, in a lot of contemporary, especially young men, but not exclusive, not exclusionary uh, for this kind of mythical understanding of the self and the self's individuation process. But, you know, I don't think Peterson really, you know, he may be able to hold that in a multifaceted way, but he doesn't hold the left in a multifaceted way. It's very often straw man. So I think, again, that's sort of his limitation. Um, he may be able to offer things complexly, but when it comes to the left, it's often caricatured. And, and uh, uh, Zizek pointed that out in the debate and it's been pointed out ad infinitum, um, even by rebel wisdom. Uh, so, so, um, I think we can appreciate him in the end, what I'm trying to say for his kind of classical humanities. I don't know if he's a traditionalist exactly, but to me, he reminds me of like a 1950s liberal arts college professor who's, who's a depth psychologist and he knows the biblical myths and he knows this kind of the, the archetypal story of individuation and he's triumphing these kind of classical understandings of meaning. And people love that because it's been so lost in our culture with, with cultural fragmentation. So I don't know if that makes him an integral thinker, but he is expressing something that's been lost. Uh, Charles and then Karen. No, I had a thought, but uh, I think I'll pass. Um, and I will have to leave in a few minutes, so a bit early, Ryan. So I thought I'd let you know. So in case I don't get a chance, thank you all for this morning. Always good. Thanks for being with us, Charles. Yeah, I basically just had a footnote to what Jeremy was saying. Um, part of my sense as a cultural historian by training, my sense of green is a terrific sense of the lack. Um, as we don't believe in the traditional amber level gods anymore, and we no longer trust science to be the great understanding and achievement that's going to bring us prosperity for all. Look at the horrors it brought us with, with the uh, atomic bombs, you know. So we go into the green culture and the, and the cultural shift happens in the 50s and 60s. And some of us here came of age with it, right? And one of the things that I see as a cultural historian that goes along with green is this massive sense of loss of meaning. We don't believe in traditional religion anymore. We know better to believe than in all the superstitious hocus pocus. And we no longer believe in science. And this is, you know, I was talking in a previous talk about the, the existential dilemma. Um, there is no meaning except what we bring to it. And, and I could just name this long, 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 long list of cultural icons of the postmodern era that are about this. You know, you know um, Rocky Horror Picture Show, which I think is one of the great cultural um, products of, of, of green. The last line, the punchline of Rocky Horror Picture Show is crawling on the planet's face, an insect called the human race, lost in time, lost in space, and lost in meaning, meaning, you know, the music trails off. Uh, this is kind of one of the core issues of green and so that's just basically a postscript to what Jeremy Johnson was saying. So somebody who can give us, can help us get our footing again at these levels, resurrecting what is good and good and lasting of lasting value at all the first tier levels. What a contribution. And that, that qualifies him as maybe an unconscious spiral wizard, but he's, he's acting like it over and out. 
Yeah, that's. I, I was thinking of that. She reminded me of some of my experience of his lectures. Of, um, yeah, the the meaning thing because sometimes when I think of him as green, like for example, I parked him as somewhat green because of the Carl Jung and all this kind of stuff. But you're right, Karen. Like green is a real struggle with meaning. I remember with me, like I watched a few. Of it, he'd like crit, um, he'd analyze things like Pinocchio, or the Lion King. And to have this like massive influx of meaning, even for like kind of children's films, was such a a rush of fullness. And he seemed to as well. Like um, I think you mentioned maybe this, Greg. Um, I'm gonna rephrase it a little bit. And you said this, I think, last time on our Sunday call about the myth of the given that is a thing that comes out in green. Like you're less sure about science and and Amber and all this kind of stuff. And it definitely seemed like Jordan Peterson really honed that. Like I've watched him wrestle with like, you know, the Nazis and the Soviets and all this kind of stuff. And it seems like he's really struggling to get somewhere to, to solve it. And yet he admits that he hasn't, he hasn't got there yet. Um, the all kind of seems a little bit like green plus, which kind of makes him more in the, the integral realm. Um, uh, I had another point. I think I'm going to bloody forget it. Um, Oh yeah, like his his um his portrayal of the Bible is kind of to an extent an evolutionary story. I think he even it says that to an extent explicitly. Like you start off very, it's kind of God is in the clouds and it's very divided, and then it slowly becomes more and more sort of embodied and humanized to the point where you have Jesus Christ. So he has that evolutionary story in that, but he also seems to have this like blue reverence for suffering and development but in a way that seems to have more of a modern edge to it like for me i think one of the really important things at integral is this deep time perspective of evolution that i kind of feel like jordan peterson does have i think he's a little bit confused about it and possibly like when he for example when he's struggling with things like soviets or the nazis possibly the jury still being out as to whether we're really getting anywhere but it does seem like that's a really uh a really strong trend of what he's, of what he's saying. Go ahead, Theo. Yeah, I, I, it makes me think. Um, in general term, I think in this in this era right now, uh, we have a lot of thinkers coming online, uh, and I think someone mentioned rebel wisdom and inter intellectual dark web, and I think that was. I just got into it maybe six months ago and I was like, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> and uh, we, an integral, more integral thinkers will be like, what's the, what's, what's my approach is, what's my, what's the strategy? How can we make, remake meaning if we need to, in, in the sense that we're, we're meaningless if you want. And I, I talk, a lot of my friends are, are more into a green space and I try to kind of like work with them and just like, what's the meaning you you're making in this world for yourself and for, for others. And, um, I find it interesting that all these different um, perspectives are, are coming together and willing to have a, a discussion, uh, a, a, more than a debate, uh, I think. And uh, one of the work that actually really inspired me in my own um, education, I was doing my master's in, in sustainable development, and, and I came across Otto Scharmer's work, and he's literally talking about that, you know, like from debate to dialogue to uh, pre-sensing, he calls it. And... Um, I think it's always, um, and then other people also obviously talking about like being in the flow and all these kinds of, uh, of uh, capacities that we can have individually, but also as a group. And uh, my point is, as integral thinkers, uh, it becomes really important to be into that space of dialogue, obviously, and beyond into that space of uh, pre-sensing, if you will, to uh, um, think about strategies, think about how we can uh share with all kinds of mindsets and and worldviews to strategize if i can say or help this uh worldview come online more uh into uh and be embodied into our structures embodied into our uh, if i can use that word into our systems uh our social systems or uh, social structures um, and then obviously still continue to work on the interior levels as well in interior dimension i mean um, as a constant. Uh, so those are two important aspects. And, and as an integral thinker, I think we, we get that. Uh, it's not just like, oh, work yourself out and everything's going to be fine. It, it's, it's a bit more than that. I think in the presenting 
really helped me understand that because when you come in as a facilitator, uh, some of you would know, um, you work with all kinds of worldviews and, and you need to, to kind of let, a, facilitate a process that will make it possible to born a new sort of perspective. Yeah. Right, yeah. Thank you, Theo. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing in Sharmer too, because I'm a fan of his. Um, this, is, this is a question I wanted to, to uh, pose to the group here, which is that it seems to me that a key point of kind of confusion or contention within the integral, integral community is the issue around green and postmodernism. And I think I kind of look at it as two sides of the uh, spectrum. On one side, people are um, disqualified from being integral because they're too green and other people are disqualified because they're not enough green, like they don't integrate that. And so it seems like green, and it kind of makes sense given that we're supposedly coming out of that. So we're still figuring our way through the rambles. But I want to ask Jeremy a question. You said that Jordan Peterson doesn't, it seems like he doesn't fully grok the postmodern turn. And so can you just share, you, that was the last thing you said before your time was up, but I just wanted to give you another chance. Can you say what that means? And also what would it look like if he did at Rocket, like what would he say or do that differently that would make you say, oh yeah, he really does get the postmodern turn and therefore he is in rule? Oh, good question. Wow. Um, yeah, I think, okay, so let me a answer the last one first. If, if he had a more positive expression of so-called green in the postmodern, I think he'd be very, um, well, I, I think he would be very, yes, like a very affirmative towards the, the deconstructive efforts, the understanding of power structures as a form of psychology, as kind of like, yeah, we have to understand the dynamics of power. Let's not be excessive about it. But you guys are totally right. It's so true. We need to be aware of that. This is a level of reality that, we, that came online in the 70s and in the 80s. That's excellent. That's brilliant. So if he said more of that, and he does say that every so often, but usually as like with huge disclaimers. Um, so I think that would be definitely a, a positive, but um, uh, the only other aspect would be um, the meaning aspect is not just singular. If he was more pluralistic about his meaning expression, because he's kind of going back to the, the, the Christian occidental expression of depth and meaning and archetype and what the feminine means and what the masculine means. And it's beautiful and it's, and it's, historical and as part of our Western culture, and he's holding that. But I think if he could see that the postmodernists are experimenting with that too and help them lean into it more, you know, to pluralize me meaning. And I think that's very difficult to do. I think um, you have to look towards somebody more like James Hillman than, uh, than, uh, than Peterson, who, who's experimenting with that decentralization of the archetype, but he's still playing with the archetype and the psyche. So I think Hillman is what you would Hillman is a good example of a left-leaning uh, thinker who's more about not just the individual, but also um, the context in which the individual is in. It's not just about cleaning your room, but what if your entire society is sick? So, and how that affects the individual. So I think if he was leaning more on the social, I guess we would say the, the lower left um, and not just the upper left, that would really help him kind of grok the green. Um, but why I think he's not just really quickly um, again, I think he's a perspectival guy. I mean, he, he's triumphing what we might call in the integral world modernism in that he is uh, like a classical neoliberal triumphing these values and archetypes and depth, but he's also integrated with science, like a lot of people in the 1950s in the perspectival world were. But in, in, a, in a certain sense, there's a tragedy behind him because he's triumphing a world that's already over. And, and I think he knows that. And his alert, allergism to post-modernity is rightly placed in the sense that he's right, that the world that he's triumphing is already gone, you know, and we are kind of a, a bereft of orientation. And I think he's trying to reclaim something that, that can't be reclaimed in, in, in some respect. So, yeah. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, great, great answer. Um, so it's 11.16, so I thought we'll, we'll begin doing this checkouts and people just give their two minute pitch on, on yeah, well, kind of what, what your takeaway was from this conversation and maybe how did this change the way, I think we'll have to do another one of these, I think it's, this deserves a lot more attention, but maybe people can share if there's any way that you, they change their mind a little bit, change a perspective on considering uh, what, when assessing, appraising second tier thinking or, or uh, thinkers out there. So whoever, whoever wants to go. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. Yeah, I, uh, I, 
this thing about uh, bereft of meaning really resonates with me. And I think that the utility of second tier, not so much is it or is it not, but you know, holding the value of all that came so far, how do we create meaning? How do we create new paradigms? How do we sit grounded in unity consciousness and each of us are there and each of us are tapping into that? And then how do we find a field between us that is fertile and that we could say, like a real problem and throw it in the middle and something is birthed out of that that isn't just me sitting here with my uh, mental models bashing away with what's never worked in a sense or has partially worked how do we birth anew and that's that's really what i'm leaning into now and this has sharpened that edge for me so thanks so much thank you greg Wow, that was beautiful, Greg. Thank you. I totally endorse that. What this conversation did for me is, I've already explicated it in part, is when Ryan posed the question in his email yesterday, I kind of came up with, okay. I went right to that axis of uh, structure stages. And then that got augmented, as I expressed, by Charles, who said, well, but you've got to in include the quadrants. But I want to add that to me, to say, to ask, is somebody integral or not, it's not binary. And I've had, I think I've had this conversation with Ryan. To me, it's like maybe, maybe the plurality of me is in green nut right now, like 38%, but 22% is maybe turquoise. And, but then there's that 14% that's red. And so in every given moment, I'm spread out over a number of state stages, structure stages. I'm more in one quadrant and, and less in some others. So it's, I, I think of this as kind of like an amoeba that always has shifting boundaries. And it shifts. It shifts hour by hour, day by day, year by year. So to me, this is a, a nuance. It's not binary. There are many, many dimensions to it. So to what degree is somebody working in integral now rather than being stuck in one in only one of the previous stages so I, th I think we, we I'm going to think about how to fine-tune the very questions we're asking here thank you very much go ahead Heidi I want to go ahead from what Karen said what about ask ourselves and do a show about that why do you think that you are integral <laughs> And what I'm very interested in is also, where do you find meaning in life when the traditional or the, the meaning with which you came into life probably, which was probably a, in our case, a, a blue meaning, in your case, a green uh, value. Uh, where do you find your real meaning? You know, what, what's, what's your life up to? And then the other thing which I noticed when do you do we finally i mean uh, even in europe but also so, uh, especially in america come overcome this right left thing that's really making me sick which everything is seen politically right there's on the right this is on the left this is right this is left this is so so annoying we i think we need to find a completely new way of of politics which is not this against the other but I don't know how, but Ryan will figure that out. <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, Heidi. I think I connect with that as well uh, in so many ways. And also, it's a good question to ask yourself, how, how do I perceive myself as integral? Um, it's something probably that I can, uh, can talk about as a self-reflective uh, uh, exercise. Um, there was something else I wanted to say regarding, oh yeah, just like a distinction regarding green. Green can be experienced more from an individualistic perspective or more from a pluralist, pluralist, perspective, pluralist perspective, sorry. And um, it's important to distinguish maybe a bit more. And sometimes we get kind of maybe um, confused between how these um, values are experienced in the world, in the world around us and in us as well. 
Um, and it's just, yeah, I think I, this, this non-binary, this ability to, um, to hold on and say, wait a minute, I don't know, I don't know ex specifically about that. Um, and I think also an, an integral perspective, an integral worldview, an integral culture, if you will, um, has yet to really come online in so many ways. It would, we're talking about it because we want to see uh, it um, a lot uh, alive, I think, and that's where the the meaning is uh, for me, at least, um, to push the envelope, if you will, uh, to um, resolve some of the issues that we've been creating and so many uh, dynamics we're involved in economics, politics, business, uh, relationship, uh, men, women, uh, all of that stuff, all that interesting. And the fact that we're interested about all of these, I mean, for me at least, I can, I can only speak for myself, but um, I'm wanting to connect with others about these in a different way, in a more, um, for lack of a better word, uh, integral way. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's always great to talk with you guys. <laughs> um, for some reason, I'm sort of aware of how caring it seems when sort of integral classification is at its best, like really being deep and like nuanced, like is somebody, uh, genuinely at a certain stage or biasing something and also being quite nuanced in the sense of it does feel like the whole question of whether somebody's integral or not got dropped pretty quick and then it kind of got into quite specifics and to me I guess it's kind of like um, it's kind of heartwarming in some ways when I I think of looking at the world with with more nuance is that so it feels like there there may be more integral out there than I'm than I'm realizing, or like there are more um, maybe some of the sort of public intellectuals that are out there. There are times when they are they are talking in integral language, or there's perspectives that actually happens. And um, so sort of related to my experience lately, I I sort of feel like I'm wrestling with quite a lot of sort of ambiguity lately. But one of the things that I think I'm starting to do is this kind of differentiating myself uh, integral from other people at times but that instead of it being like too much of a, a push away it's more about appreciating the the value of integral um which can be it can be hard to define the value of integral and can be hard to define what exactly is integral but i do feel like the more that's clarified the more uh its qualities and the actual value of it actually really comes about Actually, it does make a difference if somebody's really coming at things from an integral perspective. Like, for example, with Jordan Peterson, I do feel like the things I value most about what he said, uh, at the very least, are I would classify as like on the way to integral, at least, if not actually integral. Um, so I guess I'm just aware of this kind of compassion for other people and, and also possibly the, the compassion that integral can actually have um, itself that can be... Uh, differentiating from from other levels and stuff like this. All right, who who hasn't? Uh, oh, go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah, so I think for me, what what this conversation has has helped to lean into is, I think I've heard this from um, Greg saying that. And um, also Theo, the, the desire to articulate what integrality means to clarify it, because I think the more we lean into integrality's concepts and characteristics, the more it can clarify the dynamic processes where everybody is at, that, that we should rely on and lean into that more. Um, and, and to that end, you know, I, I just wrote this down earlier in my notes, just sort of summing up uh, everything we're saying, who's integral, who's not integral. Um, I, I wrote, I prefer to think that integrality is a shared or inherited phenomena and that their manifestations can occasionally glimmer in people who realize it in cultural expression. So, I, and maybe this is because of my uh, more Gibsarian approach, but the, 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 the structures when we're talking about perspectivalism or the mental structure, these are more like theaters or landscapes or geographies in which the cultural dynamics of progressive and conservative are playing out on that they have this deeper processual 
um, um, interplay that is more like a tectonic plate that's slowly transforming with many, many, many deep geological layers um, and which we are sort of just on the surface of with our cultural dynamics. And I think that perspective can actually help us a little bit get through some of the weeds in, in the complexity here. But then also it, it puts us in the, the most meta or whole oriented perspective possible, which is what are the qualities of a perspectivity and integrality um, and, and really trying to identify them because then if we do that, we lean into the new. And so I think for me, what's left after this conversation is a desire to explore those integral thinkers, not just the entrenched battlements about is Peterson integral or not, but like what is a perspectival thinking? Where is process thinking and temporics emerging in culture? How is it happening? How is this our shared collective ontology right now? How is it manifesting? How are we trying to realize it collectively together? Because, you know, the perspectival world is falling apart in this crisis. So those are the questions I want to lean into, you know, where is it in art? Where is it in, in cinema? Where is it in, in the sciences showing up, not just in the, the entrenchments of political cultural debate? Thank you. Yeah, this was, this was really a fruitful, um, did everyone go? I think so. Um, I just want to say to you, Heidi, I love your, I love your idea for a topic. Why am I integral? <laughs> it's, it's, it's so, it's something, but it's just so funny. It's just, makes me laugh um but i think i think that would be great to explore that that in, in greater depth uh, j just to continue this theme as what jeremy was saying you know of, of kind of clarifying what integrality and you know what does this mean what does it look like how is it appearing and, and how do we differ on how we think you know and i remember um reading a book recently where i almost thought it would be funny you know i highlighted my notes with my markers and I was like maybe I'll have a marker for each color so if a certain statement was that green I highlighted green if it was a teal I'd highlight because that's kind of how it is you know I mean it really is a whole mixed bag and everyone is all over the place and, and everything and I guess the last thing I was leave the group with today is how I this is something that's my how my thinking has changed as I've gotten older I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say as I've gotten more integral but I've got as I've gotten older <laughs> I'm not gonna fall into that trap and before I used to think that integral was just a amalgamation or a, all of the as it was just being a mix of all of its individual parts of stages so if you have a well oriented you know integrated red blue orange and green there you go but as i've gotten older i've kind of realized at least for myself how it seems like teal or second tier is more than the sum of its parts and how when you're coming from that world viewer perspective it usually does draw out a completely different reality or, or way of be making meaning or a completely different system that we live in, in society, politically and economically and institutionally. And so I've, as I've kind of felt into that more, you know, it, I've, I've seen how, yeah, it is, it is a whole new adventure to really take the leap, so to speak, to second tier and, and to, to, be, to manifest that fully and not just be manifesting green and blue in all these other stages like my parents do, you know, and they're definitely not so yeah Heidi go ahead yeah I want to add something which we didn't talk a lot about it is very much about your inner psychological development and your personal growth when you really go into integral you must have some really big transformations not only in worldview but in your own being and I see that often integralists they say they do uh, shadow work but they don't have any idea about the real, the water in which they are swimming, including me. But I had a moment when I realized that, and I see that many people still don't have it. So we, we need to dig deeper, deeper in the upper left uh, uh, and not only go to the other quadrants. I, I think really the upper left quadrant is the guiding quadrant I mean, our own development, and in, that's why I so agree with Jordan Peterson. If we don't do it, we can have all sorts of thoughts and all sorts of perspectives, but we don't, we are not transformed into a, something higher, you know. So my plaidoyer to really work more in the psychology and of ourselves, and it's not easy. You know, we think it's easy. And, uh, and I can only give you the, the example when uh, we do shows about death and dying, almost nobody comes because nobody wants to, to talk about that. They all, it's 
somewhere else, you know, when it comes later. And uh, so many taboo uh, things which we have in our psyche, which we don't want to deal with. And that's integralists are no exceptions. <laughs> so <laughs> just that would be a topic when I come back. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and, and Heidi, so you're leaving us, um, soon, so you're not, you won't be uh, with us this Sunday. No, I'm, I'm not even on Sunday. I will be away for three weeks, more or less. Okay. Well, have a wonderful trip. Yeah, thank you. I look forward and to I hearing about tell it. You how it is. It is the first African integral conference, and I'm very curious how that will be. So, good. <laughs> we'll want to hear about it from you when you get back. I will do a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I will all make your, sure. all your safari pictures, adventures. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a huge I lion chasing you or something. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.